So, uh, as I told you before yesterday, imaging is constructing one-dimensional, two-dimensional, <coughs> or three-dimensional uh, plot or a, a mapping of a certain physical quantity. Uh, the uh, acoustic imaging, you are mapping the material density, as we agreed or as we told you uh, yesterday. In microwave imaging, you pick up another quantity, which is usually the permittivity or the dielectric constant of the material. Uh, the problem, or one of the problems with the imaging is if you map some quantity, and this quantity is the same, has the same value for two different materials, you cannot distinguish between the materials on this map, or based on this map. Imagine that you have uh, acoustic imaging, you have two materials with the same density. So they will appear the same, so you cannot distinguish between them. The same applies also to microwave imaging, because in microwave imaging you are plotting or you are mapping the dielectric constant or the permittivity. If you have two materials, different materials with the same permittivity, uh, you will not be able to distinguish between them in the image, neural image. Therefore, and this also explains why if you go to a doctor, uh, he is not content or she is not content with just one type of imaging. They try first the most cheap one, which is acoustic, ultrasonic. As I told you before, uh, the, uh, the economy plays here an important role because you buy something cheap so you can uh, use it for 10 years. So the price for just one image is very low. If you buy some, something uh, expensive like MRI, it's of course uh, an, another order of magnitude. Uh, if, a, if the doctor or if the investigator is able to distinguish based on material density, it's okay. If not, he asks you to make another one. Maybe the next one, which is a little bit more expensive. Huh? So imaging is usually uh, ambiguous. So you, you have ambiguity in interpreting materials, interpreting the, uh, the image itself, and, and, and so on. So this must be kept in mind. And in your engineering uh, career, or in your, during your college time, maybe 80% of the time was uh, invested in studying linear systems. So you approximate, even if you, if you deal with an amplifier, amplifier is a nonlinear system, you linearize. Linearize, linearize. The linearization itself has a very, very uh, nice characteristic, that, that it is unique. If you have a linear system of equation, you can, you can invert it if, the, if it is uh, good conditioned or not ill conditioned, and you have a unique solution. This is not the case for inverse problems. This, this is also called the direct problem. Direct problem, let me, let me uh, give an example. Uh, if, you, if you know, you have an electric circuit. And if you know the values of the resistances, of the inductances, of the capacitances, and so on, you can, and I ask you, please uh, calculate uh, current and voltage and so on. This is called direct problem. You know the properties of the, uh, of the circuit, and you are asked to find out the state, state, voltage, and current. In imaging, it is the other way around. So you measure the state, you measure something from the system, and you try to find details of the system. Therefore, it's called inverse problem. So direct problem and inverse problem, it is very, very similar to the, to the design problem. If you see, remember, in the first couple of years in your study, you were engaged in, uh, in analysis. You have a circuit, you have an amplifier, and so on. Maybe in the final year, you started to design. Design means I will give you the specifications, I will give you the characteristics of the filter, and please find out the topology of the filter. Uh, which connections, which resistances, which inductances, and so on. Imaging belongs to this category. It is an inverse problem. And as you have, uh, as you may have noticed in, in designing a filter, you don't have a unique topology. If you still remember, you may have 
exactly the same characteristics with this topology, maybe parallel connection here, series connection, and so on. This is non-unique solution. <coughs> okay, again, in the imaging, we have the same feature. So we may have different interpretations or different images uh, for the same thing. Okay, so keep this in mind because this is actually the, uh, the uh, most uh, relevant or most important characteristics of imaging. That from the first beginning, don't expect to have a unique image. Don't expect to have a unique interpretation. And I will show you examples of that. Uh, one is caused by the nonlinearity of the inverse problem, and one is uh, caused by the ill conditioning of the inverse problem. Ill conditioning, just to refresh your mind, even if you have linear system, if the number of equations or number of measurements you could collect is equal to the number of unknowns you are looking for. Okay? In this case, if it is linear, you, you may have a unique solution. Or you, you must have a unique solution because it is linear. If it is uh, nonlinear, even if the number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns, I will, can, can show it using a very, very simple example, nonlinear function. Uh, may I have the... Uh, I think it's all here. <coughs> it is disappeared. <coughs> so I may, I may use the other, other part. So, if you look for a quantity x, okay, and you have a model for the dependence of a quantity y on x, whether you derived it, whether you find, and, and you know that it is linear, okay? So, say it looks like that. It is linear. And now you measure. You measure a certain quantity x. Uh, y. This is y measure. And I ask you to find which x will cause this measurement. You will find this is x. So in any measurement, you know the relation. You don't necessarily directly measure the quantity you are looking for. You measure something else. But if you know the relation between the uh, the, what you measure and what you are looking for, you have such a relation and you have a unique determination of what you are looking for. It's clear? As you see, I have here the very simple example of just one unknown and just one equation. One measurement will give me just one, and this is uniqueness. I have a unique solution of what I'm looking for. Now imagine that I have a nonlinear dependence. So this is y and this is x. Now I measure something. I may have nothing, no solution, although I have number of unknowns and number of equations. Okay? I may have multiple solutions finite. And now imagine, I will take very, this very special case, that what I measure is exactly equal to a complete range of what you are looking for, if, if what you are looking for has a saturation. And in this case, you have infinite number of solutions. So you may have infinite number of solutions, multiple discrete solutions, or no solutions. Despite the fact that we have one equation in one unknown. So just keep in, this in mind. We have two problems to talk about in our imaging. I started with this very, very simple <coughs> introduction because we will see in our imaging, in our reconstruction, that we will have such situation. But now it's very, very abstract, very, very simple. 
for a linear dependence, something like that, you will catch always one and only one solution. For a nonlinear dependence, you may catch nothing, you may catch multiple, you may catch infinite number. Clear? This is in case that you have well-conditioned system. Well-conditioned system means number of unknowns is equal number of equations. Even if you have linear with unique solution, you may have another sort of problems, which is the ill-conditioning. You have, say, 10 unknowns, which you are, you are looking for, and you are not able to measure more than five measurements. You will also have multiple solutions because uh, the number of equations is less than the number of unknowns. For those of you who studied uh, numerical mathematics, so you know you have the null space and any, any element of the null space is a solution, could be a solution. So you have in all cases multiple number of solutions. Okay, so this is another weakness and I will repeat this again and again and again uh, because this is typical for imaging, for, for especially for microwave imaging. Because you don't know, in, in many cases, if you don't know the physics of the problem, you can measure many, many times because you say, okay, I have my measurement equipment and I can measure 1,000 times, 2,000 times, and I'm fine. I will always have the same number of equations or more than number of uh, equations than the uh, number of unknowns. And this is a big mistake because in many, many situations, you may measure as much as you wish. But nevertheless, the physics of the problem tells you whatever you measure, you will not be able to, mo to have more than five equations. And now if you have 10 unknowns, your system <coughs> is ill-conditioned. Whatever you, uh, what you do. This is also one of the problems we are going to face. Another sort of the problems is even if you know that, uh, you say, no, I don't believe that. I will measure. And let us see whether I have different uh, measurements or not, or different equations or not. Now we come to the issue of noise and the issue of dynamic range. Imagine that, I will also give it here. Uh, if I'm, I'm drawing or using, I will use my surface book so that you can have, a, have it in a file. But now it is general discussion, so if, uh, it is not necessary to, to, uh, to save it. Let us uh, look to these two cases. This is linear and this is linear. Okay, and now you have noise corruption. Noise corruption, if you measure, you don't have the, uh, this linear relation, you have something like that. So, stochastic process, and you have here something like that. If your noise ribbon or noise floor is thicker or wider, then the, the area covered by the two straight lines. So although you have two independent equations, you cannot distinguish between them. Okay? The opposite is also correct, and this is more dangerous. If you have only one equation, and you measure average, and you get this one, and another time you measure average, you get this one. You tell yourself, okay, I have actually two equations. But they are, in fact, only one equation. So the noise impact can transfer two independent measurements into one, or just one measurement, which is independent, into two. So if you don't know, again, if you don't know the physics behind what you are doing, you fail. And let me stress on this point again, because in our generation, we didn't have uh, fast computers. 
all what we have, I still remember as I started, uh, as I was in, in second or third year in, in college, it was 1974. It was the first time for us to use a calculator. It was very expensive, and it was able to calculate plus, minus, 10. Before that, we used what is called slide rule. I know that most of you have never seen the slide rule, but it is a mechanical uh, way of, of computing. So, therefore, we were enforced to make analysis, to understand the physics behind, and to know what are we doing, because we didn't have the tools. Uh, now, you have tools for doing everything, and this is, it has its pros, its, its advantages, but also it has its disadvantages because many of you, you go to MATLAB and you say, invert this matrix for, you, for me, without asking yourself whether the matrix is really invertible or not. And because you have round, round off error and you have uh, measurement errors, the matrix itself seems to be uh, invertible. And, and if you calculate the determinant, it is not perfect zero. It has a value. And you invert it. And you did the mistake. Because the system itself is non-invertible. You don't have enough equations to have a unique solution. And nevertheless, you do it. Ye be why? Because you don't understand the physics behind. The main sense of this course, of this short course, is to, to understand the physics behind. And don't expect that you can use the equations I am driving here for a real imaging. Because I will divide into what is called numerical imaging, in which you can use very, very powerful simulation tool in order to have a high quality image. And this is actually what is done. So nobody uses actually what we are going to derive here. What I'm going to derive here is, has only one sense, to let you understand what are your limits. What, what, if you, do you have enough equations, don't you have? Are the equations linear or nonlinear? Uh, where should I implement my simulation tool? So now, again, we have two tracks. One track, in order to have a good image, <clears throat> I will use high quality, accurate simulation tools. But in order to understand the physics behind, and in, in order to understand the, my limitation, I must derive some simplified equations to give me a feeling what's going on. What we are going to do here, I will mix both, but of course I will not run programs. But I will try to show you, okay, this is actually what we are expecting. Okay? <clears throat> now let us come to the table of contents. I will divide imaging from the conceptual point of view into zero dimensional, and I will tell you what, what does this mean, one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional. A zero dimensional, it is maybe it is a joke, but this problem here. If you look for a single value, just a single value, and you perform one measurement. So from your measurement, you can find the value. And because the value is a zero-dimensional space, so it is zero-dimensional, right? One-dimensional means I'm looking for a curve, but one-dimensional curve. I'm looking for, I will call it profile. Especially for microwave imaging, it, will, it is a permittivity profile. So in this case, the one-dimensional imaging, I would like to perform measurements in order to, I call it sometimes, retrieve or reconstruct a profile. In our case, it's usually permittivity profile. A two-dimensional imaging, I do the same, <clears throat> but, you know, but I'm, I'm looking for a two-dimensional distribution. I'm looking for, say, permittivity epsilon as a function of x and y, or permittivity epsilon as a function of r and theta, if I'm working in the polar coordinate system. Okay? And the ultimate goal is to have the three-dimensional 
plot or the three-dimensional imaging in which you have epsilon as a function of x and y and z. This is the definition of imaging in the context of this course. And as I told you yesterday, how to represent the results, it is an, a different issue. So I get now the uh, distribution, I get now the three-dimensional or the two-dimensional function, and I would like to present it. I told you yesterday, you can say, okay, I will cut contours. In this case, if I, if I have a two-dimensional, something like the bell or something like the carpet, and I come with uh, different heights, and I get what is called uh, level lines. And these level lines may be closed contour or open contours and so on, and you may write uh, the values, say 100, 200, 300, or you may also use colors. And if you use color, you are coming nearer and nearer to the image what you, what you uh, believe that this is image. Okay, if you use color. Of course, with the, uh, <coughs> with the mathematical tools you have nowadays, like MATLAB, have the three-dimensional and cut it this way, rotate it this way, and you can look it from this side, from this side, and so on. All these are representation. We will not <coughs> tackle or we will not deal with the representation. I think you are better than me in, in presenting using uh, modern, modern algorithms. Okay? <coughs> Good. Because we are dealing with microwave imaging, we will use waves <coughs> to interact with the object to be imaged. And the, the uh, process or the procedure itself is very simple. You illuminate the object, which means you produce a wave. In our case, it's an electromagnetic wave. This wave is incident on the object. And upon incidence, you have two possibilities. Either you say, I'm only looking for the surface image of the object, like photography. The light doesn't penetrate in your body. So actually, it is incident on your face and it is reflected, okay? This is one sort of imaging. Or if you look into the object, <coughs> you would like, 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 uh, like medical imaging, you would like the wave to penetrate, interact with the material, comes back with information about this interaction, and you catch this backscattered information and try to extract the details of the object based on that. So this is the two sorts. One is surface. I'm not penetrating. I'm just illuminating, and you reflect. So I make use of the first reflection, because you may go imagine that you have a glass. So you cannot say, okay, the glass will reflect completely. It will penetrate and reflect on your eyes and come back. And in the image, you have a sort of three-dimensional because you get this plane and this plane. But usually on the skin, you don't penetrate anymore and you have only, only the skin. So we have, we, we have to use a wave. The wave will be incident on the object may be reflected only on the surface, on the surface of the object, and I collect the reflection, and I try to reconstruct or retrieve <coughs> the details of the object based on that. Or, after the initial reflection or the first reflection, it goes through, collect information about the details of the interior of the object, comes back as a backscattered wave, I collect it again and try to retrieve the details inside. What I told you before, that whether we have enough information or not enough information, whether we have ill-conditioned or non-ill-conditioned, whether we have a linear dependence, because you can now imagine what is what I was talking about now. Imagine that you, your unknowns are the different permittivities in the different pixels in your head. Now you illuminate and the wave goes through, interacts, and comes back. And you measure. So your measurement 
is the backscattered wave. Your unknowns are the values of the permittivities at the different points in your head. As I told you before, we need first a relation between what you are looking for and what you are measuring. So now, if the backscattered is a linear function of these looked for uh, permittivities, I have a linear system. And I can say, OK, how can I measure from different directions? So I illuminate from here. And I can measure from different directions in order to have independent measurements. I have equation number one, number two, number three, number four. And if I discretize the, the points in my head, so I have now, I look for 10 by 10 by 10. OK, so I look for 1,000 points. I must measure uh, 1,000 times, hoping, praying, that I will have really linear and independent. In this case, I have a unique. But this, this is never the, the case. OK? <clears throat> so therefore, we will talk at the beginning on plane waves as the most simple form of waves you can generate and you can deal with. And then we will spend some time in what is called one-dimensional depth imaging. So I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm tre retrieving something from inside, from the interior. And this needs penetration. And this is actually the most important part of this lecture, because, or of this course. Because <clears throat> if I understand the, uh, the process for one-dimensional imaging, the extension afterwards is very, very simple, at least for, from the understanding point of view. <coughs> I will move afterwards to two-dimensional surface without penetration, because you may have two-dimensional penetration, or two-dimension only because you have a surface reflection. I don't penetrate. And we will see also uh, what are the effects of the uh, operating frequency? Because a plane wave has a certain frequency. Should I change the frequency or should I have a bandwidth? And what is the impact of the bandwidth on the resolution? What are the effect, the impact of the frequency itself on the penetration and so on? And then when we understand both here, we will go to the, to the most general one, which is this three-dimensional image. And if we understand it, I will go to what is called synthetic aperture radar. This is a mean for increasing resolution by artificially increasing the aperture of the antenna. For those of you who are involved in antennas, I think you understand what I mean. If you have a big aperture antenna, you may sample very, very with high resolution. Your, your beam itself, for those who are not who haven't had, uh, say, course on antenna or something like that, just let me know. And I can give you, maybe in, in 10 minutes, uh, an overview about what is antenna, what's the impact of the aperture, and so on. Uh, otherwise, if I assume that every one of you knows what's antenna, what is, what is the antenna characteristic, and so on, I will not do it. OK? We need OK, so uh, just, just at, at this point, just uh, Raise your, your hand at when, when, we are, uh, when we are there. Just raise your hand and, and tell me, OK, I didn't have this before. Can you explain it a little bit? So I will go uh, outside my lecture, make a very, very quick explanation, and come back. OK? Good. <clears throat> so afterwards, this one here has been treated already, because I didn't know that I will start with MRI. <laughs> but we, still, we, we started with MRI, so, and we talked about that. So I think we will only uh, have a very, very uh, quick uh, ref refreshing your information about that. Also, this one has been dealt with before. Because the, the order I prepared the lecture for uh, didn't assume that I will have the MRI before and didn't assume also. So these, these ones here, the steady state versus and magnetic resonance, you can, you can say, OK, they have already covered. And then I will uh, talk about what is called ground, ground penetrating radar, because <clears throat> since 2001, 
we are deeply involved in, uh, in Magdeburg with ground penetrating radar. So we have a measurement set up, we have the equipment, we have the antennas, and we have the signal generators, the network analyzer, and so on. Just to show you a, a one sample practical system uh, with some results, if we have time to show the results. Okay, <clears throat> I will go, go through the, uh, the, the different chapters so that when we start with the chapter, you know the, the outline of the course. In, in, in chapter one, which uh, will be called plane waves, uh, we'll talk about uh, what is the difference between a component and a dependence of a, of a, of a field. Uh, we will see uh, also the difference between normal incidence and oblique incidence. For one dimensional imaging, I will assume that I have a planar interface between free space where I can access, generate the signal and access the backscattered wave, and a half space uh, in which we have the unknown object to be imaged. So imagine that you, are, you, you divide the, the entire space into two half spaces. This is, say, free space. I'm standing here. I can generate the wave here. I can measure the backscattering here. I'm not allowed to dig into the other half space. The half space is, for me, the thing which I'm going to image. And I don't have any accessibility. I can't go into, I have any measurement there. I can measure only here. And this is actually, this defines imaging. Because if you describe the problem, somebody can say, OK, let us measure here. I tell you, no. This means you should dig into, and you, sh you will distract the, the object to be imaged. This is holy. This is forbidden. Everything should take place in, in, in one half space when I have the, my measurement equipment, when I have um, my uh, uh, generator for the wave, and, and, and all this stuff. OK? So because electrical engineers love current and voltage, uh, you, you, you don't like electric field, magnetic field. The, the, any electrical engineer looks for a circuit. So and here I and, 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 and V and so on. Uh, I will work with voltage and current, although the, the physical quantities are fields. But there is a very, very simple uh, mapping or simple interpretation based on the transmission line theory. If you had a course, even if it is fundamental course, in transmission line theory, so you can follow up. Because in a, in a transmission line, usually you, you deal with TEM lines. And in a TEM lines, transverse electromagnetic, the behavior of transverse electromagnetic waves is very similar to plane waves. They are not the same, by the way, because you may have transverse electromagnetic, uh, which is not plane, and you may have a plane wave which is not transverse electromagnetic. Plane wave has a very, very uh, concrete definition. If the phase fronts are planes, this is a plane wave. But for a wave, what, what does phase France mean? Uh, or mean, uh, uh, if you look all, to all points which have the same phase and look, is it a sphere, is it a cylinder, is it a plane? This is a plane wave. We are talking about the phase, only the phase. But within this plane, you may have different amplitudes. You may, like laser, if you look to, to the cross section of a, of a fiber. So the fiber itself has TEM, which, and, 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 and the phase, uh, phase front is a plane. But if you look to the intensity of the laser itself, it is something like Gauss. So it, is, it has a maximum inside. So uh, the phase is plane, uh, but the amplitude is not plane. So you don't have a plane where you can say, OK, the amplitude is, is constant. OK? So. I will refresh your information afterwards about uh, what you know from the uh, transmission line theory. What is 
local input impedance, what is local reflection coefficient, and how can I transfer impedance from a place? It, I know that it is just refreshing your information because most of you uh, have already had a, a fundamental course on transmission line. Who, who has it? Okay, so for this case, but, but you, you heard something about plane waves. Okay, if, if, if necessary, I will, I will tell you what I'm, I'm talking about. But the rest of you, I may assume that, that you, you heard the fundamental course and you know what is the reflection coefficient, what's input impedance, and, and all this stuff. Okay? Good. <clears throat> also, you know what is multiple reflection. So if you have uh, what is called stratified medium and I have a plane wave which has a partial reflection at an interface and has uh, a partial transmission and then it meets the next interface and, and based on this interface you have another reflection and the so this is actually we will repeat it again and then we will go to what is called small reflection approximation this is a this is a tool in my hand in order to simplify things don't forget that we we in, in, in this course, we would like to understand. We, our goal is not to have a high quality image. The high quality image will be done by what is called numerical imaging. And numerical imaging, all what you need for numerical imaging is a good simulator. Most of you know CST, for example, this is finite difference time domain simulator, or HFSS, which is finite element uh, frequency domain, these are the most known, but of course you have a long series of other simulators, maybe a little bit cheaper, but these are the most known uh, simulators we know nowadays. If you can operate them, you can image, but you must understand first. Okay? Good. Based on the uh, small reflection approximation, we will have a simple relation between what we measure outside and what we are looking for. Good. If we have time, because we have in this course some deep, uh, deep uh, subjects, if we have time, I can show you more uh, mathematics uh, which support wh what I what I approximated before. But let us see, depending on the available time, whether this is necessary or not. For me, it's mo much more important to have an overview, to let you understand. And if we still have time, we can go a little bit deeper. And this is here what is called Riccati. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Riccati equation, and how can I get this small reflection approximation from the exact equation and so on. This is actually. Uh, some, some more details. Let us see whether uh, we will go over this with uh, some mathematics, how to solve the uh, differential equation and how to approximate and so on. Uh, these are one, two, three, four. And we may skip this if necessary and come to, if I have, if I, if I can measure in baseband, I can access frequency zero up to certain maximum frequency, <coughs> or in other situations, uh, I cannot access frequency zero. If, if I have waveguides, uh, so you have a cutoff, say, for X band of 6.5, I think. Uh, so you cannot access the base band. Uh, can I measure in a, in a pass band? So say from 6 to 10 or something like that. In the two-dimensional imaging, and this should be maybe uh, uh, on Friday, today is Wednesday, tomorrow is, is break, and on Friday, uh, we will concentrate on what is called surface imaging, in which all what we learned in one-dimensional doesn't help us. Uh, the two-dimensional is basically dependent on antenna arrays. So we'll see that 
with your knowledge about antenna, you may retrieve the features of a surface. It, is, it has nothing to do with the penetration, with interaction uh, between the penetrated wave and the material. It's just the first reflection on the surface. And for that, if you know antennas, you can understand this. So in this case, we will uh, look for antenna arrays in general, one-dimensional, refresh your information. Uh, how can I uh, beam form? How can I beam s uh, steer the beam? Uh, and and uh, the relation of all that to the imaging of, of radiation source. Why, I, why I'm calling it radiation source? Because if you il illuminate a surface, the surface back scatters. And this back scattering can be treated as a new source, a secondary source. And actually, the imaging is, is a reconstruction of this. And we will also uh, deal with, because in, in antenna arrays, you have the aliasing problem and how the uh, extension of the uh, antenna array and the separation between the antenna elements may create what is called in the imaging uh, community artifacts. Artifacts are something which you see on the image uh, with because of hard, it is not physical. And uh, at the end, so we will generalize to the uh, two-dimensional array. In the three-dimensional uh, <coughs> imaging, uh, it needs a little bit uh, deep information uh, about uh, Green's functions. And so let us see whether uh, most of you, the majority of you, can follow. Otherwise, I will uh, make it as simple as possible. So you, we will deal with the with uh, a far field of a current distribution because uh, if we if we image we don't come very very or necessarily come ne very very near to the object to be imaged i would like to be far away and measure and as you know if you go far away all evanescent modes because you illuminate it interacts works as a, as a secondary source. And this secondary source has also what is called evanescent mode. These are fields which decay very, very quickly away from the surface. And now if you say, OK, I, I'm, I'm, I'm far away, you cannot measure them because it is exponential decay. And if you measure far away, uh, you, you cannot detect them. And unfortunately, these highly attenuated fields uh, includes or convey the high resolution information. OK? And this, is, this, of course, tells us from the first beginning. This is a limitation. If I'm far away, I cannot measure any high resolution, any fine details. OK, whatever you can do. Even if the simulator tells you you can, you can say no. You lie. The simulator lies. Because you don't know the, if you know the physics, you know, OK, if I'm far away, I lose information. Therefore, such aspects will be also treated in here. And I will repeat again the ill conditioning, the ambiguity, and so on. We'll move afterwards to the synthetic aperture reader. Well, what is what is the concept and uh, the frequency range, synchronization, and stability of the synthetic aperture reader, and the steady state? We covered this before. Magnetic resonance imaging and the ground penetrating reader. I will show you the uh, setup which we have at the university with some model examples. Okay, this is the outline of the course. Do you have any question before? We start. OK. <clears throat> so let's start with refreshing your information about plane waves. Nobody can tell me now what is the relation between what you are talking about and our course. I, I, I spent now more than half an hour just to tell you the, this skeleton. So if I'm talking now about something, don't ask, OK, uh, what are you talking about? You know, now, plane wave is an essential part of, of our 
course. Therefore, uh, let us now forget the imaging and, and, and go back to uh, refreshing your information about plane waves. Again, the contents, we will uh, uh, talk about field component, field dependencies. I think this is just a repetition. Uh, usually, uh, if we work in a Cartesian coordinate system, it is a right-hand system. Uh, this is usually oh, the the standard or standard orientation of x y z, and um, if we uh, deal with the unit vectors, I usually use uh, the old uh, unit vectors i j k. Uh, you may now uh, i j k for the unit vectors. And in order to simplify everything, I will assume uh, propagation in x direction, which means negative x is a free space where I am staying, where I am measuring. Positive x is the object to be imaged. OK? So in this case, we will have two polarization of a plane wave. Either a plane wave, as you see, as you know, this is the propagation direction, this is electric field and magnetic field, and if you have a right-hand screw and you screw from electric field to the magnetic field, the screw itself goes along the direction of propagation. In this case, we will have uh, two possibilities. If this is x, the direction of propagation, either E and H or E and H. Okay? So, say E, X, H, Y or EY minus HX. This is the plane wave. When I'm talking about dependence, which means the functional dependence, which is here, the entire field depends only on X. And if I'm talking about component, E here may be in Y direction. The dependence is on X, but it is in Y direction. This is a component. This is actually what I meant, difference between dependence, the functional dependence. In all cases here, it is only. And the y and hz, or ez and minus hy. OK? Good. What are these quantities? Again, refreshing your information. Uh, this is called propagation constant, or wave number. Or wave number. OK? It plays like. I told you yesterday, plays the same role like a frequency with respect to the time. So this is the, the special frequency, frequency of coordinate x. Okay? Because for time you have omega times t, here you have k times x. So this is the wave number. Uh, <coughs> the wave number itself, I will not go into the derivation. So the wave number is given by the operating frequency. We are working in the frequency domain. So we don't deal with time dependent phenomena. We are dealing with the monochromatic at a given known frequency. Time square root of the permittivity of the space times the permeability. The relation between electric field and magnetic field given here, H is Y times E or E is Z times H. This is called entrancing impedance. It characterizes the medium itself. Now look to these two here. So the whole thing has only two parameters, except for the, the strength of the excitation, which is E naught. Uh, we have K, which is omega times square root of epsilon times mu. And we have impedance, which is square root of epsilon divided by mu. Starting from now, we will not do any trial to measure permittivity or permeability. They are not accessible for us. We will try to measure these two quantities here, k and y, or k and z. These are wave quantities. You can have them from the wave. OK? But as you see, I have the product and I have the ratio. Can I 
have the two individual parameters? Yes, we have two equations. These are nonlinear equations, but nevertheless, I can have the permittivity and the permeability. So starting from now, when I say I'm retrieving permittivity profile, I will not retrieve it directly. I will retrieve it through either the uh, impedance, the intrinsic impedance, or through the uh, propagation constant or the wave number. OK? Good. Another point. Most of the materials we deal with are non-magnetic. You, if, you, if, you, if you have uh, medical imaging, it's your body. You don't have magnetic material. You are not <coughs> magnetized. So therefore, most of the algorithms which we will deal with assume from the first beginning that the permeability is constant and is equal to the permeability of free space. Mu equals mu, mu naught. And in this case, actually, we don't need both quantities, wave number and intrinsic impedance. We need just one of both. Okay? We may use the second one just for justification. Or, as you see, as you know, uh, you never measure 100% accurate. So you have uh, noise corruption, and you have uh, dynamic range of your measurement uh, equipment. Therefore, if you have a mean for uh, providing you with additional information, you may uh, minimize the measurement error. In, like, I think you, you had a, a basic course on numerical algorithms like optimization. You may have uh, more equations than the unknowns. Uh, and these more equations are used in order to minimize measurement errors. So in this case, it is good to have another source of equations. But mathematically, if we assume that our measurements are infinitely accurate, it's enough to retrieve only k or only z. <coughs> so again, refreshing your information about some other quantities, pointing vector. The pointing vector uh, is given by one half uh, cross product between E and H conjugate. This, is, this definition applies in the frequency domain. And I stress here, and please keep this in mind, we don't work in time domain. We don't work with time dependent quantities. We have already in all these analyses, performed a Fourier transform. And our quantities are phasors, which phasor is, sometimes you call it vector, but is, I, I distinguish also between phasor and vector. Vector is a, is, a, is a special vector with x direction, y direction, z direction. But phasor is a complex number which, which describes a phase. And, and here, keep it in mind, if we have a vector, if we have a phasor, uh, this phasor represents a sine or cosine time dependence with the frequency omega. We are working at certain omega. And the angle of this complex number is the phase of the cosine or sine. So we may say our time dependence signal is cosine omega t plus phase phi or minus phase phi. And if I take the phase phi and I take the magnitude uh, build together a complex number, this is a phase. Just a measure of the balance between electric stored energy and magnetic stored energy. If it, if it is zero, we have a balanced system in which the stored electric energy and the stored magnetic energy on average are equal. Why I'm stressed on average? Because you may uh, model this as, as two glasses. One we will call electric glass, and one is magnetic glass. And these glasses uh, could be uh, filled with water, say. This is the energy. And imagine that you take this electric and magnetic, and you take the water from this glass to this glass, from this glass to this glass. This is the oscillation you have. Resonance, or zero, reactive energy means that if you fill the electric glass completely, you have nothing in the magnetic glass. 
If you fill the magnetic glass completely, you have nothing in the electric glass. So you can actually have a completely stored magnetic energy at certain time instant, or completely stored, uh, uh, completely electric stored energy. Okay, this is also called resonance. For power engineers, you know that also. This is uh, the uh, uh, F factor, this cosine phi. If you, if you go, I don't know whether it is in, in India, the same like in the States. In the States, till, till recently, uh, you saw uh, big barrels on the uh, overhead lines. And these barrels were actually condensers, capacitors, just to improve or to compensate for the inductive uh, load caused by households and, and so on. Uh, I, I am not sure whether in India you use the American system. I, I think uh, it is British system, basically, and you... Uh, the Still, huh? Because now, now they compensate... Okay, okay. This is, again, the same, whether we use it in microwaves or we use it in power. Uh, by the way, power engineers, uh, they, are, they use the same tools like uh, microwave engineers, but, but with two different frequencies. We, we deal with high frequencies, they deal with uh, low frequencies, but on the other hand, we deal with tiny power, milliwatt and microwatt, and they deal with megawatt and so on. So this is a uh, sort of compensation. And by the way, also, uh, everything in, in the electromagnetic theory is scalable, linearly scalable. If you have what we call antenna, in this size at one giga, you may have it exactly the same topology, but multiply by say one million, and you have, will have the same performance maybe at 50 hertz. And, and, and uh, radiation, and all, everything which we deal with can be transferred to lower frequency, but on, on, a, on a, uh, other scales. Okay. So the uh, reactive power is a measure of uh, the uh, of the of the balance between the magnetic stored and the electric stored. If magnetic stored is more, this is positive, and you have inductive situation. If the electric stored is bigger than the magnetic stored, you have a capacitive. Okay. Uh, one of the differences between circuit theory. And electromagnetic theory is the fact that in circuit theory, you did a very, very nice approximation. You, from the first beginning, you told yourself the physical dimensions are irrelevant. Okay? Therefore, we will assume that we have a point storage. I don't consider the physical extension of a capacitor, of a coil. It is something like a point in space which you have purely electric field, and you call this capacitor. Or a point in space which you can have purely magnetic field, and you call this inductor or inductance. Okay? So, in, in, at low frequencies, you can identify areas where you assume that it is purely electric stored energy, or other areas where you assume, and I say assume, in, in reality, you have predominant electric field or pro predominant magnetic field. And if you, if you would like to improve your approximation, you say, if I have a coil, I have stray capacitors. Just to account for, within the coil, I still have tiny amount of electric stored energy. Okay? And or if you have a capacitor, you say you I have a lead inductance. So the, the, the wires connecting the capacitor, you say, okay, they have. But this is just to, to say, okay, I have predominant electric stored energy or predominant magnetic stored energy. This is in low at low frequencies. At high frequencies, you are not able to do it this way. So you don't have an area where you can claim it is it has uh, only electric stored energy or only magnetic stored energy. Every individual point has electric stored energy and magnetic stored energy. 
okay, as if you have tiny coils and tiny capacitors at each individual point. Okay, so this way, this is a relation between energy stored about radiated power and uh, and pointing vector. I will work always with propagation in x direction, with uh, say e y and h z. But if if you have a, a different uh, coordinate system, it is not so bad because here a generalization of if I have now this is my coordinate system and I have a plane, this plane has the uh, normal we will call it k and if you rotate now from e to h you go through k is it is it clear because sometimes you look at this way and sometimes you look at another way so this k is coming out of the surface e and h are perpendicular to each other and they are per, are, are are lying on this surface and both are perpendicular to k Direction of propagation, electric field, and magnetic field. In this case, you can have a nice representation. Electric field is along the unit vector u. Magnetic field is along the unit vector v. The propagation direction is along the unit vector n. u, v, and n forms right-hand screw system, or right-hand system. and the relation between E and H is again the intrinsic impedance and uh, the uh, wave vector K is the wave number K times the unit vector N. This is wave number and this is wave vector. Okay, Wave vector has a wave number as magnitude and direction is a direction of propagation. Uh, you may uh, decompose all three unit vectors in x component, y component, and z component in order to work with the with the uh, uh, classic unit vectors or the traditional unit vector this way. Just again, this was related to the directions, related to dependence. In uh, in the simple case of propagation along x, we had here k x. Now we have a little bit more complicated because we have the dot product between the wave vector and the uh, position vector of the point. So you have k dot r, which means it's, it, you have a propagation constant in x direction, propagation constant in y direction, and propagation constant in z direction. Okay. Important is if you square this and square this and square this, you have k squared or the wave number squared. Again, the pointing vector, based on that, you can uh, easily prove that it is along the direction of propagation. Okay? This is a value. And as you see, if you have uh, a capacitive medium with, uh, with negative imaginary part, the capacitive is, is a negative imaginary part. In this case, uh, uh, you have... Uh, uh, so, uh, no, the capacitive medium is in Y, it is, uh, it is positive, imaginary part, but if you conjugate, it is negative, and you have, again, negative imaginary part and the other way around. Okay? Good. Let us come now to our imaging problem. And let us assume, based on my definition, a zero order or zero dimensional image. I told you before, zero dimensional, I have one measurement and one unknown. One dimensional, I'm looking for a profile, a one dimensional profile. Two dimensional, two dimensional profile, three dimensional, three dimensional profile. A zero dimensional, in this case, I am here in free space and the other half space is a homogeneous medium filling the entire half space. And my task is, can you tell me what is the permittivity of this half space? And this is a zero dimensional image. Agree on this? So I have half space positive x with material, which I don't know. I, I'm not able to look into. I'm not able to do anything. 
And I'm staying in the uh, free space. I can do everything in the free space. I can have my, my antennas, my generator, my measurement equipment, and the very, very simple I may ask you Uh, primitive profile. What I succeeded in this I was talking about one dimensional so this is my x-axis I'm coming here and this is Epsilon of X. I'm coming here with Epsilon naught and I jump to Epsilon of the material. It's a step function. It's a profile. I just wanted to show it to you in the context of imaging. So I retrieved the permittivity profile, which is very, very simple in this case. It is a step function. Correct? Good. Who, who uh, runs this, uh, this session? Who is the boss here? You? No, 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 because I'm, I just wanted to know uh, how much time do I still have? Actually, uh, we actually did another talk on 11, that we would talk on this at a different location. 
Okay, should I, I, uh, ah, so you need uh, 15 minutes? So I still have six minutes in this case? Actually, uh, we have a tea break also in between. Excuse me? Tea break. Okay, so should I, should I stop here? You are the boss, just let me know. <laughs> Okay, so I can I can stop here because actually I talk and talk and talk and based on my watch here we have 1040, correct? So I will just continue this sentence and we stop here. Is it okay? And please, please tell me, like like in any conference, stand up and say uh, you have three minutes, you have five minutes, because otherwise I forget myself. <laughs> okay, so I think we can close here. Because I showed you how to perform a zero-dimensional imaging. And I hope that I try to express it in this context so that we go step by step, step by step, until we have the three-dimensional and we are done. Zero-dimensional is done. Correct? Thank you. Yes? Yes, you measure just a reflection coefficient. Because based on that, measure this. This is known. This is known. The only unknown is Z. And in Z itself, it is square root of mu over epsilon. Mu is known. Is mu naught. So I think this is one equation and one unknown. It is nonlinear equation, but with unique solution. OK? OK, thanks. Yeah. Hmm? Our epsilon zero, and then it is going to be dependent. Exactly, exactly. So it is a profile. It is a step function. Very, very simple profile. So the the question here before before I leave, the question here is how can you measure the reflection coefficient? You have two possibilities. Either because I am talking about plane wave, but you can say I will put everything in a transmission line. Just, just to, to bring it to near to you. Of course, I, I can measure with antennas and so on, but I, I don't want to make it complex. Imagine that you have oversized TEM transmission line, coaxial cable. Okay? Now, you put your half space in this coaxial cable. And in the coaxial cable, <coughs> you connect it to slotted line. Do you still remember how, how have you measured the impedance with slotted line? See where are the maxima and the minima, and you can find the phase of the reflection coefficient, the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. Therefore, I assume that you are RF engineer. So at least you had a course on, a fundamental course on transmission lines. So just one example, how can I measure reflection coefficient? The most simple way, if you are rich and you have a vector network analyzer, you are done, because a vector network analyzer will give it to you. If you are poor, uh, you can have a slotted line and run the, uh, the carriage and measure where are the maximum and the minimum and, and, and how big is the maximum uh, and, and the minimum and you can find the R. Yes? Okay, good. Yeah? Depth, because actually the, the question here, why have I called it depth imaging? Because I'm going through the material. I'm, I'm, I'm retrieving quantity from inside the material. I don't, because this is, uh, uh, so the, the, the other way is I just find the surface. I don't, I don't go into, I don't penetrate inside the, 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 uh, the subject to be imaged or the object to be imaged. It is depth. Still, we are looking only at the reflection coefficient. We measure. We measure only the reflection coefficient, and using this reflection coefficient, I can construct or reconstruct this image. This is a more simple image, step function. OK? Any other question? This is the next step. This is the next step. As I told you, the next step here, what you say, this is a one dimension. But, but here we have a zero dimensional where we have just one step. The next step, I will have what is called stratified.
since 1998. He joined the Petroleum Institute in Abu Dhabi as a distinguished professor in 2012 and 2013 as an organizer of the research activities for the oil and gas industry in this area. In 2014 and 15, he chaired the SP work and documentary at the University of Akron, Ohio, USA. Which one? Uh, this is the microphone. So I should. This is for recording. Yes. So let me let me. You can can use the other one. And this one should be here. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. So, uh, I think after this nice presentation, I don't want to say anything about myself. Uh, I enjoy really the stay here in your great country. It's a very, very nice country here. It's my first visit in India. And uh, many, many thanks for all who uh, organize these meetings. Uh, my talk today is on uh, what is called massive MIMO. You may ask yourself what has this to do with the uh, intensive computation and the uh, intelligent computation. If you look to the, uh, any smartphone or any communication platform, I would call it communication platform, uh, including your laptop, including your iPad, including your smartphone, including smart sensors, which uh, measure everything nowadays, they are based on very, very intensive computation. So nothing is done nowadays like 20 years or 40 years ago, as we had the, uh, the very simple analog communication and analog signal processing. Now everything is done uh, numerically. Everything is done using very, very intensive uh, algorithms uh, to make things possible. Uh, and this is actually the relation between computation, smart computation, or intelligent computation, and another area of science, which is mobile communication and mobile data transmission. Uh, you may have heard uh, about uh, LTE or 4G. So most of you are very happy to to be uh, able to use, uh, to download with 120 megabit per second and uh, to, uh, to have uh, video streaming and at the same time you can Skype with your friends and uh, simultaneously you can uh, write down an email, send it and you can have multitask using this small thing which is the mobile phone. And maybe Many of you haven't asked themselves, okay, what is, what is behind? Uh, which technologies and which science uh, allowed us to use, to communicate mobile, to uh, transfer huge amount of data uh, using very, very small thing. Multitasking, and I can do everything nowadays. I can uh, book my hotel, I can uh, make a money transfer, I can do everything, nearly everything. And this is actually what 4G, or what LTE, offered us. And maybe many people say, OK, that's enough. We don't need any more. But uh, you may have heard something about IoT, Internet of Things. Or sometimes it's also IOS, Internet of Space. Uh, one say that we succeeded to uh, interconnect people together. This is people networking. So you can uh, contact any person, anywhere, anytime. But this is applied to people, 
to human being. And up to 4G, up to LTE, uh, the task is done. Maybe with some exceptions, but, uh, but generally speaking, the connectivity between people is there. The next generation is how I can connect people with things. Therefore, the, the abbreviation IoT or Internet of Things. It's expected next, within the next 10, 10 years that you are not only connected with people, but you are connected with sensors all over the world. You are connected with the equipment in your home. You can uh, observe your car. Uh, you are here and you say, oh, I may have forgotten the window, and now it's raining there. Uh, and instead of calling your wife and please run to the car in order to close the window and so on, now you can have uh, maybe some applications are, are already there. You can, you can observe the status of the car. Uh, this is actually for fun, because just to make yourself or your life more comfortable. But much more serious is for what is called smart cities or smart hospitals, where I just give one example, and I may use this couple of minutes just to, to uh, highlight the importance of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, if you, if you uh, design the energy uh, sources for a city, uh, most people who are involved in, in such a task have a very, very weak problem. Should we create infrastructure which can cover the peak and in this case, this infrastructure will not be used except for one hour. It is money. Or should we uh, create the infrastructure for the average, which is cheaper? But now the question, what happens in the, in the peak? Uh, how can I solve this uh, peak hour? Maybe it is just half an hour or one hour. Okay, and this is actually one of the, of the major problems for, for feeding cities and uh, big uh, countries with the electricity, with power. Uh, within the framework or within the context of uh, connectivity with things, uh, you will experience uh, a remote control of everything in your home and everything in your house without any permission from you. So if the uh, electricity company thinks, OK, this guy is not at home, and his refrigerator is working, if I switch it off for 10 minutes, nothing will happen. If I switch his uh, heating uh, system because he forgot it, or she forgot it, uh, until he comes back or she comes back, uh, nothing will happen. So that I can optimize the uh, usage, the electricity usage, globally. <laughs> and this is a part of Internet of Things. Uh, next generation equipment like refrigerators, like heating systems, like uh, stoves and so, they are equipped with Internet connectivity so that for the electricity company can control it for any other purposes. Of course, there are some, some concerns about misuse of that or uh, uh, abuse of that, but, but in general, uh, we are going to the generation or to the time where we are connected with things. The same applies also for hospitals. Uh, instead of having a patient in the hospital, you can send him home, and his home or his room is uh, fully equipped with sensors measuring the blood pressure, measuring the heart rate, measuring maybe also ECG, and so on. And this is transferred online to the hospital so that the hospital, you have a monitor and you can monitor the status and you don't need to stay at hospital. You can go home and we take care of you. So just, just two examples of the necessity of IoT, of the necessity of uh, the new generation of communication, which is 5G, and the necessity within this context of intensive computation, optimization, and smart computation, and what you call also in smart or, or uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, I hope that I could build up the relation between uh, your topics or your, what you are expecting 
and what I'm going here to present. Massive MIMO, or MIMO in general, maybe one of, uh, so some of you have heard about MIMO. If you buy nowadays uh, <clears throat> access point, you may read, okay, it is working in band N uh, at 2.4 and band AC at 5 giga. And, in, uh, and you, you read, okay, it is 3x3 uh, three three MIMO or 2x2 two two MIMO. And if you have 3x3 three three MIMO, you may uh, reach 1,300 megabit per second. Uh, if you have only 2x2 two two in N band, you have uh, something like 300 megabit per second and so on. These numbers uh, are relying on what is called MIMO. MIMO is the abbreviation of multiple input, multiple output. And in, in its very simple uh, definition, it is something like if I send information using different time slots, if I have certain one second and I have two people or three people who are willing to communicate using the same physical link, physical channel, together. So you may say, okay, I will assign uh, person A the first millisecond, person B the second millisecond, and so on. This is called time division multiplexing. So you divide the time into slots, and because you cannot feel uh, that you didn't communicate in the next millisecond, it is too fast for you to recognize. In this case, I can use the same link, same physical link, maybe a cable or maybe a wireless channel for serving multiple people. This based on time multiplexing. There is also what is called frequency division multiplexing, in which you say, I will let everyone communicate the whole time, but I will assign person A a bandwidth around, say, one gigahertz, and person B a bandwidth around two gigahertz. And because my link is called broadband or wideband, it can actually communicate or can, can transfer both signals. So this person con uh, is assigned a band, frequency band, the, the other one is another frequency band, and you can communicate simultaneously. This is frequency division multiplexing. In later years, uh, maybe 15 years ago, or maybe also 20 years ago, uh, the communication guys or the communication community invented another type of multiplexing which is called code division multiplexing in which you use the same bandwidth and the same time for two people but each people is uh, has his data coded encrypted using a certain code so that if they if if you mix both together uh, the receiver the receiver has keys, code keys, which can distinguish between person A and person B. So now you have what is called code division multiplexing. So what is the purpose of that? So I would like to minimize the hardware infrastructure because this is money. So I am using the same uh, cable for many people, different frequencies, different times, and now different codes. But this is still enough, not enough. If you have cables, it is not a big problem. But if you use air, which is a wireless communication, uh, you interfere with each, with each other and you have some limitations. And now, but nevertheless, we would like to enlarge the, our capability and our capacity, communication capacity. Antenna people know that you can have some system which is called antenna. Uh, which can direct radiation in just one direction and other directions are not served. This is something like the torch, if you have a lamp, a torch, and now you can say, okay, I'm lighting this part or this part. So antennas work in this way. So you have high directivity antenna in which the antenna itself produces what is called pencil beam as if you are connecting the two people with a wire. And because the space is still big, you can also connect another wire. So now this is called space division multiple access. Space, in space division multiple access, you use antenna signs, you use your antenna 
expertise, antenna background, in order for a transmitter to produce multiple beams. This beam here is dedicated to, uh, to user one, another beam is dedicated to user two, and so on. And this is space division multiple access, or the space division multiplexing. You can now combine all. You can have simultaneously time division multiplexing, frequency division multiplexing, code division multiplexing, and space division multiplexing. And in this case, your uh, hardware infrastructure uh, is multiplied by a factor of n. So you don't pay money anymore, but you have the same hardware infrastructure. So, what we understand under massive Mi uh, under MIMO is multiple input, multiple output. It is not more and not less than to equip the transmitter for wireless communication, to, to, to equip the transmitter and the receiver with multiple antennas, which are capable of producing multiple beams, and each beam can convey a data stream if you have two beams you have two data streams, if you have three beams, you have three data streams, and so on. And therefore, I come back to your access point. If you read in your access point, it has two bands, 2.4 and 5 giga, and it, is, uh, uh, it has uh, three by three MIMO, which means the transmitter itself has uh, three antennas, which are capable of maximum three data streams. Now, each data stream is capable for the band AC of uh, 433 megabit per second, if you multiply this by three, you can achieve 1,300 megabit per second. This is the maximum capacity. Don't believe that, because actually they write it down, but the actual situation may allow for maybe only one stream, maybe one third from here, one third from there, and one third of, from that, but the maximum ultimate uh, data, data rate is multiplied by three because of the MIMO. Okay, this is the introduction of what is MIMO and for which purposes. Again, what is the relation to your expertise? What is the relation to massive computation? We will see that these technologies uh, need very, very intensive computation. And, and you have a small equipment with a very limited uh, power supply. It is your, uh, your battery. And uh, if you don't succeed to have a very effective software algorithm which conducts or which performs a task uh, in a very short time and without uh, huge complexity, uh, you cannot use the, your battery for more than one hour. So it is, it is essential that you uh, develop very, very effective and very, very efficient algorithms for performing these tasks. Because you will see it is, it is it's really crazy what nowadays a small smartphone or sm small platform does in order to allow communication, in order to create these data streams, in order to multiplex, to make use of this application, this application you are streaming, and at the same time you are writing email, and at the same time you are uh, Skyping with your uh, friends, and, and all this multitasking uh, you can imagine you have a processor which manages everything and tries to maximize the data rate and minimize the energy consumption in order for you not to charge your telephone once every hour, but once a week. So therefore, the efficiency of uh, computational algorithms is really very, very necessary to uh, to have such uh, advances in our communication. Okay. So, the talk itself is on different uh, entities like MIMO, like multi-user MIMO, and like massive MIMO. Uh, uh, who, who runs? Uh, b b how, how much time do I have in order not... Huh? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, so I will go, I will go uh, quickly. So this is the outline. I will talk a little bit about the introduction. I, I done it before. Uh, maybe I will skip because this is detailed talk about uh, what, how can we model wireless channels. Uh, what is conventional MIMO, which is known since maybe 15 years. Uh, what is multi-user MIMO? 
uh, which is known since maybe three or four years, and what is massive MIMO, which is going to be used in the next 20 years. And then uh, I will go to the uh, 5G standard. This is a huge research area. Uh, if we still have time, we will talk a little bit about the phase array and beam forming, which is necessary for creating independent data streams. Let me go first what the, uh, the classification of uh, wireless channel. Uh, if we have here a transmitter and here a receiver, we may connect them using one channel or multiple channels. This is the channel itself may be a pair of wire, if you have wired connection, or a wireless. And now the question, how can I have wireless communication with multiple channels? And this is actually the MIMO. If you use at the transmitter uh, multiple antennas, as I told you before, and these multiple antennas are capable of producing multiple beams independent of each other, and you have the same at the receiver, under certain conditions you may create independent data streams, independent channels. And I will show you how this is done. So I will skip now the analysis with time, uh, with the uh, channel modeling and so on. I will come quickly to the conventional MIMO where the multiple reflection within a room, the indoor communication uh, became very, very advantageous for the communication. Uh, in the past, so communicating within a room was a, a very, very challenging task because you don't have what is called line of sight, the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna, they see each other, and you have the channel. The channel is just the line connecting both, this line of sight. Now, the receiving antenna uh, receives a direct line, which is line of sight, and because you have walls, you have ceiling, you have uh, floors, the uh, transmitter itself sends here a ray, and this ray is reflected here and may arrive the receiver, so the receiver itself receives multiple versions of the same thing, which was in the past a very, very challenging problem. But uh, with some further investigation, one could show that, no, we can make use of that. Because I can, if I have the transmitter here with a transmitting array, and the receiver here with a receiving array, and I have multiple reflection, I can adjust my system in such a way that each path is an independent path or independent data stream. And in this case, either I take the uh, very, very high data rate, say one gigabit per second, and I, am, I know that I, I could create, say, five paths. So I send 200 mega through this path, 200 mega, 200 mega, and so on. So that the path itself is still, from, from its data capacity, is still limited, but because of these independent data streams, I can multiply the data rate by how much independent data paths or data streams can I create. So this is actually the uh, main definition of MIMO. Of course, here are some supporting equations. Uh, maybe it is not the proper place here to, uh, to discuss about that. Here, again, some analysis regarding uh, what is called channel matrix. The channel matrix is, imagine that you have at the receiver five antennas, and at the transmitter you have eight antennas. Now, how to relate the received signal at the five antennas to the send signal at the eight antennas, I think anyone can come to the conclusion I need a matrix for, uh, for expressing the relation. And uh, we can show here, based on some simple analysis, that the rank of this matrix is actually the number of independent data streams which we can get. So just, just uh, qualitative uh, description of what's going on. Now, one of the challenges of the, uh, of the MIMO, as I told you before, you need uh, multiple antennas at your station, at your smartphone. And now, uh, 
if you if you have a smartphone, this is I think has this has a, a length of 15 centimeters times seven centimeters, something like that. And in order to have a multiple antenna accommodated in this small thing, this is a challenge. And in order to overcome this, you have to go with a frequency higher, because for antenna people, they know that uh, the same antenna with a certain size at a certain frequency works exactly like another one if you scale the frequency and the size by the same factor. In other words, if I have one centimeter antenna working at one giga, it is equivalent to one millimeter antenna working at 10 giga. Okay, you, you, uh, because, because the dimensions are actually uh, related to the wavelength. So now in order to have in a small and very small smartphone, multiple antennas up to 16 antennas, so you have to go with the frequency higher, and this is actually what is intended in the new generation, in the 5G generation, where we will work using the 28 gigahertz band. Till now, if you have some information about the, the bands which are used now, you have some bands are around the 2.4, other around the 5 giga, and that's all. Uh, this is here. Uh, some explanation of what is MIMO. So if you have a transmitter here with four antennas, these four antennas, they may create two independent data streams to serve this user, but this user and this user are served by just one data stream. So it is not necessary that you have just single transmitter and single receiver and you would like to, uh, to have more data rate, but you can also, as a base station, you have, you can create, say, eight data streams, and you decide, okay, this laptop here, it needs more data than the smartphone. I will direct two data streams to this laptop, one data stream for this mobile phone, one here, and so on. So this flexibility, the, the base station itself is a very, very intelligent entity. So it can decide and can also know uh, which need, uh, whether I'm now streaming video for a TV, in this case, it needs more data streams. Or uh, this uh, person here is uh, using just voice transmission, just calling, and it needs very, very lower data stream. So based on the usage, uh, you can decide how can you distribute your resources, the number of independent, independent data streams between the different users. Uh, again, this is some example here, one stream for this iPad, one stream for this iPhone, and two streams for the, uh, for the uh, mobile phone. Again, these are details for massive MIMO, and this is actually what we are going to see in the next couple of years. You will have a uh, mast, exactly like the uh, uh, mobile masts you see all over, all over the cities now. But instead of having just finite number of antennas, what we have now, you will have such a situation. So you will have what is called antenna array, I see, here. Maybe up to 1,024, two to the power 10 antennas, okay, which is capable of producing independent data streams for different users. Uh, also, you can direct two or three to this one, just one to this one, and so on. So this is actually, uh, what we have till now is this 4G, uh, in which you can have maximum of two data streams, what we have now. Here, we are targeting up to 10 data streams. Okay, so this is also a scenario for the antennas we need for the mobile phone, up to four by four array, and for the antennas you, uh, needed by the base station, which communicates up to 256, but uh, there is also thoughts up to 1,024. Okay, let me summarize what is targeted in 5G communication. This is the uh, official logo of 5G. So we targeted is a data rate of 
download 20 gigabit per second, upload 10 gigabit per second. It's really huge. The density, how many equipment, how many sensors, how many laptops, how many telephones are served by a base station, up to one million. It is called now IoT devices because I, I, I don't want to say it is a smartphone. <laughs> It could be a sensor measuring uh, air pollution. It could be sensor measuring the bridge health. So you will have everything. So therefore, they call it now IoT device in order to say it, it could be anything, which is which communicates with the base station. And now you can imagine in a in a square kilometer, the target is one million of such sensors and laptops and so on. The mobility, the targeted mobility, but of course, you can take the train. You have nowadays the high-speed trains in Europe, in Japan, uh, up to 500 uh, kilometers per hour. And for those who are acquainted with the communication and that and, and electromagnetic wave propagation, this is another challenge, how to communicate with a moving object. So I am the base station, and the moving object is moving now with 500 kilometers an hour. Uh, am I sure that what he receives is actually what I sent or not? Of course, these are details related to what is called Doppler effect and so on. But this is actually the targeted. A much more important attribute is what's, what is called latency. Latency, if you send a request and you would like to take a decision based on the answer of the, other, of the, of the, of the receiver, uh, and you cannot wait. So if the receiver, if, if first your request takes a long time because it didn't, it wasn't received correctly, and the receiver says, no, I didn't understand it, please repeat it. And you repeat and repeat and repeat. And you would like to take the decision now. So this is a latency, which is a time uh, between the request I sent and the answer I received. For some applications, it's very, very, very important in order for the transmitter to take a decision. The targeted latency in 5G is less than one millisecond. What is called spectral efficiency, uh, they measure this for each hertz bandwidth, how many, many bit per second can you use? Because the bandwidth itself is very, very uh, valuable attribute. You pay lots of money if you see any of the mobile uh, communication companies like Vodafone, or, uh, they pay to the government a lease money or lease uh, fees just to use this specific frequency band. And therefore, it is economically and also technically very, very important to maximize the data rate per hertz because you pay for, say, one megahertz, one million, and you would like now, and you get your money back from the users in terms of bit per second. So you would like to maximize that, and the target is for download 30, bit per second per hertz, and for upload, it is half of that. These are some topologies of the future antennas to be used in massive MIMO. You may have, uh, this, this will be mounted on buildings, and there are also thoughts to make use of the uh, light uh, masts along a street to mount these antennas, because you would like to spread lots of these antennas all over a city. So these are the forms. You may have a linear arrangement of the antenna. You may have this form. You may have a cylindrical uh, uh, arrangement, a rectangular arra arrangement. This is actually the future mounting. So you may have a big house with this here, just, just covering the windows or maybe transparent, just not to, to see it or such a cylindrical array, or this is actually the, uh, the old dipole antennas. Okay, these are something about the calculations of patterns and so on. Uh, so this is not uh, essential for this talk. Maybe the last one is uh, which systems, which RF systems are needed in order to have the same antenna array serving multiple data streams. Uh, in other words, I will have, say, eight inputs, eight different data streams, and I would like to direct uh, data stream number one to this direction, data stream number two to this direction, and so on, to direct the different data streams to different directions. 
And for this purpose, you need what is called the Butler matrix. This is known in the antenna community. And this will be used in future. Uh, just just uh, an example of four by four Butler matrix. You have uh, four data streams, and you would like to direct two L to this direction, one R to this direction, two R to this direction, and one L to this direction. And this is actually the system from here to here, which separate the data streams from the antennas. It's called Butler matrix. There is another version of that, which is called Rotman lens. It is a continuous, but all, are these, uh, all these are details which are relevant for antenna community, uh, but not necessarily for an overview about the subject. And this concludes my talk. I hope I'm in time, or? Okay. So I gave a very, very short, concise overview on the concepts of MIMO, multi-user MIMO and massive MIMO. Uh, told you something about the future specification of 5G and the different challenges we are going to face in order to implement these standards. Thank you very much.